from the Mercy One Studio. Making it personal with Bishop William Johnson on Iowa Catholic Radio and iowacatholicradio.com. Welcome to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. I'm Kelly Mesher Collins with the Diocese of Des Moines. On today's show, we're visiting with Jessica Hernandez, Coordinator of Hispanic Youth Ministry at the Diocese of Des Moines. Jessica is also a dreamer who benefits from DACA, also known as the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. But before we get to today's interview, let's find out what's on the Bishop's mind. Good morning, Kelly. Good morning. So, uh, did you, we we cast off Seminary and Stan Ashes here? He's not here. So he's not uh, here today. He, He'll yeah, be back so in he, August. He's on uh, double secret probation here or something <laughs> right. here. Until, <laughs> yeah, no, until he's, he's vindicated. No, he's in good standing. All is well. So he'll mm-hmm. be with us again as well. So these are certainly not the dog days of summer. A lot going on in our, mm-hmm. our political sphere and in our church, and in so many ways as well. Uh, one's hard to kind of figure out sometimes the the consistent uh, uh, approach of the Supreme Court, but very pleased with their decision this week in the uh, case Our Lady of Guadalupe School uh, versus Morrissey Brand and uh, how they came across there and uh, affirming the ministerial exemption for all Catholic schools and all uh, private schools as well to uh, hire their teachers according to their own values set, their own Mm -hmm. ethic and mission. And it really points out, I think, at the core of this is that Catholic school teachers and administrators are instrumental, integral in our mission. Mm. They are carrying out the ministry to teach and educate and form our young people as Jesus did. And so uh, it's not some kind of separate add-on in religion class. All mm-hmm. that we are about is integral to the mission, and it's nice when the Supreme Court, by a vote of 7 to 2, affirms and recognizes that and in accord with our First Amendment rights. So uh, we can't always predict, and things have kind of cut across uh, what uh, persons of faith would have hoped for the Supreme Court in the last uh, six weeks or so, but this is one that we can celebrate in a very positive way. Uh, we're not as pleased with the uh, uh, decision of the executive branch to renew uh, federal executions after several decades. There's about five men who have been on uh, death row uh, and are uh, planned, the uh, Federal Bureau of Prisons is going to plan to execute them, including Dustin Lee Honkin, who in the 90s committed that very heinous crime, five uh, people, including two children uh, that he slayed. Uh, slayed? Yes, some of the past participle there. Uh, and uh, But uh, not to make light of that, because, uh, you know, the pain and the... Uh, the fracturing of, of lives that continues to be something that is experienced by the victims, the mm-hmm. families and children of those who were killed. And, and so there's not any way glossing over that. But at the same time, that Dustin Lee Honkin scheduled to be executed a week from today. And so that's what the bishops of Iowa, and along with more than a thousand ministers of very denominations, have appealed to our President Trump to offer clemency, not to uh, uh, release him from prison, but simply to commute his sentence to life without parole, recognizing that each one of us have an inalienable right to life, that only God has dominion, and that whether one is innocent or not, that that uh, value and dignity we possess, we can't abdicate or forfeit that. And so uh, even if we act in, in subhuman ways, that we are still human beings and that we not intentionally, unless in past centuries we know the church defended and even applied the death penalty. And I think our evolving consciousness and the unfolding of civilization to a point where no longer do we need to protect people by executing capital criminals. We can uphold the common good and the safety. And it also says something about us as a society and who we are, whether we have state-sanctioned killing or not. And so uh, this is something that the bishop spoke passionately. And then obviously also the ethic of Jesus, that uh, forgiveness and the, you know, the hope of reform. And so, yes, Mr. Honkin, by all rights, apparently has uh, embraced the Catholic faith, but that's not what is driving our appeal to President Trump in this last week and to many other voices who are calling for him. So uh, it may be a stretch, but we hope that... Uh, That will happen. On other fronts, uh, also uh, trying to uh, ask the legislators to continue to find a solution for DACA and Mm -hmm. to recognize that the right of asylum, are there people who might be trying to exploit that? Certainly. But does that invalidate the right of asylum for people who are coming from extremely violent or other dangerous situations politically and otherwise? So we'll speak with our next guest about DACA. Looking forward to getting in touch with Jessica. 
All right, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson on Iowa Catholic Radio and the Spirit Catholic Radio Network. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and John Leonetti in the Morning is provided by Blessman International. The coronavirus has impacted lives in Iowa and around the world. This is especially true in rural South Africa, where COVID-19 restrictions have led to vulnerable children being hospitalized due to starvation. To combat this hunger, Blessman International now offers a program called One Child at a Time. You can sponsor a child in South Africa for $1 a day. Learn more at blessmaninternational.org. Blessmaninternational.org. Is it time for a new roof? Then it could be time for you to get to know Bell Construction. Bell Construction is a roofing company entering its 30th year of business. They specialize in residential re-roofs, like commercial jobs, and have the experience to meet all of your roofing needs with personal service. With Bell Construction, the owner will come to your home or place of business in person to inspect and ensure the quality of work that you deserve. They pride themselves in working with you on a personal basis and making sure you are satisfied. Bell Construction, 515-963-4494. Welcome back. I'm Kelly Mesher Collins with the Diocese of Des Moines. On today's show, we're visiting with Jessica Hernandez, Coordinator of Hispanic Youth Ministry at the Diocese of Des Moines. Je- Jessica is also a dreamer who benefits from DACA, also known as the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Today, she'll tell us her story and about her role at the diocese. Always good, Kelly, not to presume people know what the acronyms mean, so it was a That's helpful right. review for me, too. <laughs> good morning, Jessica. Good morning, Bishop. Good morning, Kelly. How are you? Good morning. Good. So, you know, no stranger here as we are colleagues and working together and uh, the mission of the diocese in so many ways. So this is called making it personal. So I always like to get a little uh, personal stuff about your own <laughs> life narrative and things, you know, that, that includes uh, that uh, state institution to the north of Des Moines in Ames. So, you know, one, one yes. cyclone to another here, you know, yes. we can talk about that. But, Definitely uh, go state. Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> the Hawkeyes, uh, they just couldn't uh, stay, you know, know hang it. in there, you know, the nope. Big Ten looking for an exit <laughs> yeah. clause in so many ways. So, but uh, let's, uh, so, but uh, you're here in Des Moines. You've lived in Des Moines the better part of your life you know, some time, but uh, how did you arrive here? Yeah, so uh, when I was seven years old, uh, my mom and my grandma uh, immigrated here to Des Moines, Iowa. We already had some family here, but, um, you know, she, we lived in Mexico City, and uh, the violence was getting pretty high. The crime rate was getting pretty high, and my mom actually worked in a bank, so um, she had already had her um, instances where, you know, she she had some close calls with certain robberies and, and things like that, so um, that plus economic-wise, uh, you know, she would send me to the best schools possible over there and in a sense of, you know, private schools, but it would take up most of her paycheck and, and, and just, you know, everything that she was working towards. So um, we already had some family here in Des Moines and just them um, and, and my cousins and the opportunities that they had um, that they were already here. My mom, you know, she she looked towards that and, and definitely um, that's what really compelled her to you know, move, make the move over here, and um, and yeah, just you know. So we, it wasn't we over. wasn't a harrowing journey. It was it was kind of a normal journey to the extent you remember it. You were seven years old, but uh, yes, yes, definitely. I, I always say that I'm very much blessed. You know, um, in the sense of just the way that I arrived here. You know, as 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 opposed to and, and not to just compare. You know, to others and assume you know others' journeys. But um, to me, you know, I I flew over. You know, on an airplane just. Um, it's me thinking that it was, you know, just coming over to see my cousins, but at the same time, you know, it definitely doesn't, um, compare to other people's journeys of what they've gone through even themselves, you know, um, and crossing the border in, in other, you know, ways. So, um, definitely blessed yeah. in that sense. Yeah. In some ways being on an airplane right now is a little more risky proposition with COVID than it was for you at that time. So, but, uh, yes. but the goal was for you as any mother, you were the apple of her eye and she wanted the best for you. And so to, to create a life here in Des Moines as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, whether the private school in Mexico city was a Catholic school or not here in Des Moines, some local religious sisters helped you out. How did that go? Yes. Yes. So when we, uh, my uncle here already, um, knew the sisters, um, from Davenport, um, sisters of the humility of Mary. And, um, you know, we got connected to them through the parish because one of them was a DR, DRE at Our Lady of the Americas. And, um, you know, they, they opened their home, they opened their, um, their community and everything to us, not just, you know, as, 
as a friendship, you know, developed with us, but also, you know, financially, you know, even here, my mom as a single mom getting here, we had to find, you know, a place to live. She had to find a job. And I mean, me, you know, also looking to see what school, you know, the system, just getting uh, acclimated to, you know, the society here, my mom with the language. So, um, and actually at the time, none of them really, you know, spoke Spanish that much. It was really more of their, you know, service and their um, charisms that they had as sisters that just welcomed us and made it possible in any way that, you know, any obstacle that we had, they literally were just there along the way, either helping us, you know, overcome it, whether it was, you know, through prayer and just being with us in solidarity or just, you know, their friendship that they had, but also definitely, you know, um, even financially as well, for sure. But uh, even to this day, you know, their friendship still is what holds us. And, and, and even that guidance and, and spiritual, you know, direction that we gain from them, because, you know, my mom coming to a new country, not knowing the language or culture or anything, that those good companions, you know, that she had in the sisters, um, really, it was just a blessing in, in our angels for sure. So, oh, How marvelous, you know, that kind of human ecology and the love that that flows from that, that this wasn't just a, you weren't just a being processed or treated as a, as an object, but the, the the human friendships that were formed of that. I mean, your mom's a force. I mean, she's a beautiful woman. I've met her a couple yes. of occasions, but I, w- I wouldn't mess with her. <laughs> yes, yes, no, and I'm her daughter, so I would know. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> yes. Ah, Catholic mothers, we love them. <laughs> yes, so, no. So, uh, you, you know, you are definitely bilingual, uh, so grew up speaking Spanish, but did it shift to English pretty quickly, or did you kind of speak both languages all the way? You along? know, her her efforts of always getting me, you know, trying to get me the best education um, had me try to have me in in a bilingual school, even in, in Mexico. But it's it's still different when you're fully submerged in the language, coming to the actual you know country where you know you're having to speak it, you know, listen to it, and just be surrounded by it all day and every day. So um, it, it, since I came here at seven, it definitely was. Um, you know, I picked it up quicker, but I still definitely do remember, you know, at being at school and having to take those ESL classes and even my first sentence in or somebody else teaching my first full sentence and me having to use it over and over again. And I remember it, I, I will never forget it because it's the most, you know, um, it's, it's not even something that is used common, you know, um, nowadays, but back then I did not know how to say how to, how can I sharpen my pencil or can I sharpen my pencil? You know, you have to get permission to get up and just, you know, go to the restroom or whatever. But to me, it was, how can I sharpen my pencil? And I just remembered my teacher and thank God for teachers, you know, also that are patient with, you know, students that, you know, and, and little kids or just students in general that it's not their, you know, first language. Um, English is their second language, but I remember her spelling it out and helping me with pronunciation and that for, that sentence, you know, how, may I sharpen my pencil? And and that that itself is just um, it's always stayed with me. But it's it's you know you definitely coming to the country and being here surrounded by you know the TV, the radio, and and songs and everything. You just you pick it up quickly at that age, you know. But it's still definitely um, is part of me knowing that well that wasn't my first language, and it's still you know I struggled a little bit at first to you know just learn it. But then you know it's it's. Just you just pick it up. So well, it's, in your gratitude, you know, I I think you've uh, retained some of that patience of your teachers and that kind of persistence because you're certainly a good teacher with me when I have a <laughs> Spanish <laughs> statement or anything that I'm doing and that I can read. And you always tell me just slowly, Bishop, slowly. <laughs> you know, your, your accent's okay if you go slowly. Don't get ahead of yeah. yourself. So <laughs> it definitely does. It definitely does. You know, I think anybody that learns a second language, no matter what type of language, you know, and whenever we're learning something but anybody that learns a second language you know they you definitely um have to empathize for you know the effort and that it takes you know to to learn something that you just didn't grow up with and and then to even be making that effort it it does like you said it does take some some patience for um you know others and and this is to me i speak a second language but at the same time you know hearing other languages it's it's so much you know, it, it there's a certain curiosity, but at the same time, you know, it's 
it's amazing just for people that you know know more even than one language bishop or two you know right but, or, um yeah you know, or the or the the danish people you know know five languages or yeah. whatever you know? amazing I mean, the europeans yeah. you know so <laughs> yeah and i think you know uh, our diocese uh, certainly omaha grand island have a uh, priest from other countries international priests and so they mm-hmm. come and yeah they're they're fluent in English, but there might be an inflection, an accent. But I think if we've made that effort to try and be understood in another language, how much more patient we are. And then we just, you know, you kind of, you kind of wait on it and it comes to you. It's kind of like listening to Shakespeare, you know, it's English, but I'm not getting it. And then you just, by the second act, you're like, oh, this is making sense to me. So let's, so let's uh, shift to the political. That was our topic today. (laughs) Kelly's looking at me here. (laughs) So, uh, so, I mean, is is this identity of being a DACA person really something, you know, that you look at the mirror and that's what you see? Or, I mean, obviously President Obama made this provision for, for people who are here, and now we've got uh, over 750,000 in this country. And if we begin to think about the number of families, well, 1.5 million individuals live in households with a DACA recipient, including more than 250,000 U.S. citizens. If it were to be rescinded, well over 1 million families in the U.S. would be drastically affected by this, with a quarter million U.S. children, citizen facing the possibility of being separated from their parents. You know, and, yeah. Uh, you know, that that would be the, the, the possibility. So, I mean, can you talk about this identity and what it means to you and how, how you know, your self-understanding? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's It's not the first, um, you know, identity or part of me that, you know, that comes to mind. It, I would say it's definitely a, a big part of me just because it does you know, um, it, it definitely has to do with my my job and, and my ministry and and the opportunities that I'm able to take part in and participate in. You know, whenever I work or get education, um, and you know, just you know, being able to provide for my family and my mom. But definitely, my faith in itself, you know, has made me realize that well, anybody has you know, obstacles. Everybody has obstacles. Everybody suffers, you know, in one way or another as part of our cross that, you know, we have to carry and, and bear here, you know, on earth. So it's, if anything, it's it's more of, you know, what should bring us closer to Christ, you know, um, all, all the things that we, um, that we have to go through, you know, when we're here. So I, I, if anything, that's, that's how I see it more of part, as part of me, you know, it's, it's something that I have to go through and it's just a matter of, seeing what I need to do to overcome it and just, you know, um, to see how God is walking with me in this. So it's definitely not uh, something that, it, well, it's it's burdensome in the sense of more of, you know, those uncertainties and, and those fears of even more being, you know, separated from my mom and things like that. You know, that's, um, you know, you, you would think that, the political and the economic and me not having a job or, you know, things like that is, is what's at the top of that list. But really, no, it all has to do more with, with family and the fact that, you know, we're, we're so close and, and, you know, culturally, but just in general, you know, um, it's, it's, if anything, that's the part that kind of always gets scary, just not being able to be together and, and definitely not being able to provide for, in this case, my mom, you know, who's, given so much to me and and god she gave me life you know but um that's if anything that's what comes to mind when whenever we talk about well this is it's weighing hard on people and people as me like you know young adults is do- that have daca it's the fact that we think about our parents and the sacrifice that they've made for us and for us you know having it be just erased it's not just erasing our lives it's raising you know, the sacrifice that our parents made by coming here and the everything that they've given us and everything that they've sacrificed in order to give us what we have. So that's that's what, you know, really sticks out and is at the top of that. So, um, yeah. I really appreciate how you kind of see this through the spiritual lens and the kind of how you and your mother uh, reflect on this. And it's not just, uh, you know, a political matter for you. That uh, The Lord is there in all of this, but... Uh, and, and it, as is the cross. Um, so June 18, 2020, a month, last month, the Supreme Court issued this ruling that temporarily prevents the administration from ending DACA. But they, they've been uh, publicly stating that they're going to renew it so that they overcome that procedural hurdle as well. Uh, and so uh, kind of set on this, uh, how, you know, explain to me for you and your mother 
Uh, what, how would you be separated? Because it's clear when children are born here and they're U.S. citizens, but that DACA parents would have to return to their country of origin. But how would that work for you and your mom? Yeah, so, you know, because I applied for DACA, you know, my information and everything, you know, is already in the system for immigration services. So for me, if DACA ended, um, it, what DACA does is that it protects me from being deported, actually, um, for the for the time that I have DACA. It prevents me from being deported. So uh, I, you know, my mom, she herself actually would be able to stay, would, would stay here just because, you know, um, you know, she's, She's still here, you know, uh, undocumented, but at the same time, you know, they have no um, full right or, you know, for to her to be deported. But for me, because I am under DACA, um, you know, they, their immigration services has full custody of me and my, you know, legal status and my situation right now. So if DACA gets, you know, completely taken away, my deportation, you know, um, protection goes away, and therefore I'm automatically sent back to my country of origin. So. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you, you, you've you got a high public profile as a person. Here you are on the radio show today. Uh, you're an established person. You uh, uh, had a uh, YouTube uh, prayer service last week against racism that uh, marvelously crafted reflections. I mean, very much uh, we're, we're building up, I think, the young adults who participated in that, in the diverse group, you know, invoking the saints. And we'd like to make sure you stay on the line because I just want to get you, you said some beautiful things about the saints that I'd like to, if you're willing to carry over the break, uh, we'd love to keep you going here. But uh, uh, so you're, you know, a student and uh you know, uh, Kelly, how much time are we doing here? How, how, what have we got left? we got 30 seconds. 30 here. seconds. <laughs> Hold me, you know. We want to <laughs> remain friendly with our Spirit Catholic Radio people <laughs> as well out there in Nebraska. So our, our good friends there. But uh, So uh, Iowa State, uh, microbiology, if I remember correctly? Yes, correct. All right. Yes, we'll talk about yes. further education when we come back. Sounds good. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson on Iowa Catholic Radio. Kelly, the Kelly, Spirit keep it Catholic straight. Radio <laughs> Hi, this is Father John Ricardo, and I want to thank Caldwell Parish Funeral Home and Crematory for underwriting Christ is the Answer. Losing a loved one, as we know, is never easy, and it can leave you feeling lost and even hopeless at times. But Caldwell Parish helps ease that burden by sincerely caring both about your loss and about your faith. Caldwell Parish Funeral Home and Crematory is Des Moines' only Catholic-owned and operated funeral home. The number is 515-276-0551 or online at caldwellparish.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and John Leonetti in the Morning is provided by Blessman International. According to a 2019 Global Food Security Report, more than 820 million people in the world are hungry today. None of us can help all of them. Most of us can help one, one child. Your gift of $1 a day through Blessman International provides a child in South Africa with a daily hot meal, place of safety, educational experience, and spiritual development. To get started, go to blessmaninternational.org and click Sponsor a Child. Welcome back. I'm Kelly Mesher Collins of the Diocese of Des Moines. We're back here with Jessica Hernandez. Yeah, so uh, Kelly st- stopped laughing during the break, so we're back, uh, Jessica. Although you two uh, women of faith laugh a lot with each other, don't you, in the friendship that you share? <laughs> we <do. laughs> uh, yeah, we can't really, you know, be, you know, looking at together <laughs> to each other, you know, because we just, well, yeah, we'll just start dealing. It's, it's, it's a joy, Bishop. Yeah, it's so a joy probably you have to be more than six feet apart, right, because you're laughing. We almost so can't go to right? mass together because one of us gets <laughs> yep. the Oh, uh, yeah, it's like a yep. school mass that kids are cutting up here. But uh, So microbiology is intense. That's another language unto itself. I, I know certainly as a college teacher, the DACA students I had, if I knew, found out someone was a DACA student, I knew that they were going to be disciplined and driven. They really were going to you know, apply themselves in their studies, and they would engage in the questions and, and the, the class discussion. So it was always a great blessing for me if I had a DACA student, and some have gone on in banking. But you've gone on for further studies, right, uh, Jessica? Right, even yes. As we speak. <laughs> Currently, yes. As we speak, yes. Uh, so right now... I'm currently working on my master's in theology and pastoral ministry with uh, Boston College. So uh, that's that's been a huge rest in itself, you know, from, um, you know, the, the partners that we work with with Catholic Extension through the diocese. And they uh, was able to get a scholarship through them. And, um, and yeah, it's just, you know, it's one of those where, like you said, Bishop, you know, as a DACA recipient, 
you are driven to really make the most out of every opportunity that you get and not, you know, just to take advantage and to, you know, just make it your own and, and whatever. No, it's just that we realize that, you know, we, we, we were given an opportunity and it, and it's a gift. So why not, you know, open up that gift and, and, you know, make the most out of it in regards to, you know, our growth, our self growth, but also, you know, how we're going to put it, you know, apply it for the service of others. So, um, like you said, you know, not just in, in pastoral ministry and anything, but any any person that I've met also that has been a DACA recipient that has gone on to, you know, further studies or just even whatever they've studied, you know, it's because they know, they realize that it's, it's to the service of people and others, just because we were given an opportunity that others haven't, you know, and, and I speak this for even DACA, uh, you know, other young adults, I should say, that, you know, here are you know, in my same situation, but weren't able to apply for DACA and are still striving to, you know, make something out of their lives as well. So we, we definitely realize, you know, the the opportunity and the gift that we were given just with DACA itself. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, the American dream can have kind of mythic overtones, but there's a reality here and uh, for you and faith and, you know, the gift is given, and so give the gift in return. And I think with a theology degree, you and Myra Banuelos in the Hispanic Ministry Office, what a potent combination, the two of you. So a beautiful thing. So thank you for that. Thank you to Catholic Extension. I've been a longtime supporter of that, but it's it's nice to, to kind of see it enfleshed in what you're doing and how that tangible support. So we're grateful to Catholic Extension, too. It helps the diocese uh, in, in several ways. And so for yeah. those you might want to consider that in there. So, Jessica, we're going to say thank you. Thank you for your time. And and uh, look forward to, uh, you know, I know we're going to be entering a furlough of two weeks, but for students, there's no furlough, right? So you, no. you're going to keep at it here. Very <laughs> Lots well. of prayers and inter- intercession from, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, St. John, you know, and Bosco and everyone, all the students, saints up there. That, Do we have you to know? pray to St. Ignatius uh, Loyola, too, or the, the Jesuits <laughs> yes. of Boston College? Okay. Yes, very much. So, <laughs> okay. yes. Okay. Bless you, and uh, we'll, thank we, you. we'll be seeing you. Thank you. Thanks, thank Jessica. You. Good. Yep, thank yeah. you. Bye. So, nice chatting with your friend there, Kelly. Yes. So, marvelous. So, mm-hmm. good. Uh, we just a little bit of time left. Anything in the Catholic world uh, that you want to kind of share with us here? Or? Yes. Well, um, obviously, people are not traveling these days. So, um, Lourdes is offering an online pilgrimage. You can go online. Lourdes, France. Lourdes, France. Okay. Yes. They actually, um, they've been struggling because um, people are not going to France. So, they're having a $9 million deficit. So, people can come and participate in online prayers, online rosary. There's an online um, procession, I believe. And so... With the, um, with the, with the sick, even, you know. The, the, yes, yeah, People yes. can watch so, this from so you know, care facilities and other Yeah, places. they're really struggling. Um, yeah, so obviously it's a huge tourist destination. There's um, as, That's the second most hotel rooms in that city out of France, second to only Paris, because they have so many visitors. I so. can believe that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in August is always the, the month of the national pilgrimage of people coming from all places around mm-hmm. France. And if, for those who've been there, no, Mary is there. That's right, she is. And so we need to to support the marvelous ministry that they have. All right, this has been another edition of Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. Thank you to our guests and all of our listeners in Iowa, Nebraska, and Wisconsin on Iowa Catholic Radio and Spirit Catholic Radio Network. You can hear Making It Personal with Bishop William Johnson every week on Iowa Catholic Radio and iowacatholicradio.com.